Rise, meditate in the prayers. Lord Sabbath. All right. Giving all praises to Heavenly Father in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth for this blessed day, Holy Sabbath. We'll begin with the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6, verse 9. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. All praises to Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we pray. Amen. Amen. The Ten Commandments, Exodus 20. And the Heavenly Father spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which I brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that, that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me, and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in the midst, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Our praises to Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Psalms 23, verse 1. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head, and ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments, as the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. All praises to Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we pray. Amen. Amen. The reading of the two great commandments, Mark 12, 28. And one of the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment, and the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. All praises to Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, and Nazareth, we pray. Amen. 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 Be seated. <coughs> All right, peace and blessings, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Oh, guess what I found? <laughs> it was in my pocket. Oh, please. 
All right, let's um, turn to the writings of the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans, the 12th chapter. And we'll, um, we'll read it from the ninth verse. So the topic today, Lord, one will be let love be without dissimulation. So that's the topic. Let love be without dissimulation. And so in this in this chapter here, Paul was going into how through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, Christ having ascended unto the Father to minister unto Israel, right? And, and, and to be a blessing for Israel and returning as he promised the disciples through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, these were some of the, the offices through Christ that would be upon the saints, upon the church. And so with these gifts, right, one of the things that Paul was stressing as far as, you know, including being waiting on our ministry, you know, the Spirit, you know, through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that would give us, give some, right, the ability to prophesy, right, to teach. In all this, Paul was explaining how we have to do it through the right way, through the Spirit of Christ, right? And one of the things that Christ also taught the disciples in, in Israel during his ministry was how we're to love one another, right, with a, with a pure heart. And so as we're going to read from verse 9, this will be kind of like the focus for this class. And so we'll read it, and then Lord willing, get some other precepts to bring out the point as far as, you know, loving without dissimulation. So we'll read it, Romans 12 and 9. So it says, let love be without dissimulation, All right? So we know love is, is one of the fruits of the Spirit, right? And, and love, as we know in the scriptures, is begins first and foremost, as Christ mentioned in the two great commandments, loving the most high with all our heart, soul, and mind. And the second of the great commandments, of the two great commandments, is likened to the first, loving our neighbor as thyself, right? And so if we love our neighbor as ourself, well, that we're going to express that love as we read in here without dissimulation, right? So dissimulation is going into doing it, showing love, or expressing that love under false pretense, right? Being fake, being phony. D dealing with it as far as with your fellow brother and sister on earth with hypocrisy, right? So we'll, we'll try to get a couple examples, some examples as far as how love can be expressed out of a true heart, right? With, with charity, you know, considering yourself, you know, treating others as you would want to be treated. And then also... Even in our examples, right, we have to be mindful of that because we could be doing something that we think is just about us, right? Doing something that please you. But even in that, like we read last week, right, we have to consider others, right? Because whether your examples are good or whether they're, they're evil, that could be an influence on, on others, right? To where it causes them to go off to sin against the Most High or it brings forth good fruits in them, right? It's edifying. So Lord willing, we'll get a few examples. So that's part of that love as well, right? And then love is also correcting, right? Correcting one another in the spirit, right? And then the person that's on the other side of that love, we read in the scriptures that way. We have to confess our faults one, one, for another, one towards another, right? We can't be proud. We can't be, you know, stiff-necked. We can't be hardened in our sins, especially when the Most High is bringing out our faults, right? So that's the time, well, you know, whether we knew or not, that's when we have to humble ourselves and ask first and foremost forgiveness from the Most High and then towards one another, right? If we're dealing with personal offenses, right? Apologize. And then do it in a way where, you know, you're not harboring hatred, you're not grudging, 
Yeah? So we'll read a couple examples like that too, right? Well, we'll. So we read in here, it says, let love be without dissimulation, meaning the love is supposed to be true, right? There, there's no ulterior motives in how we express the love towards one another, right? Because our first and foremost example is what? How Christ showed that love towards who? Towards Israel, beginning with the disciples, right? And all the believers that followed him, that believed on him and repented, right? When he preached unto them. And so let's continue. It says, abhor that which is evil, right? Cleave to that which is good. So what is evil? And, and we're going to define it according to what the scripture says evil is, right? Not according to every man's interpretation, you know? And the same thing with good. Because to some people, they might feel like, you know, getting high is good right smoking drugs given given under the the uh influence of you know dealing in fornication idolatry murder right they justify that as being good doing whatever it takes to make money right even if it means you have to rob steal murder your own people right sell them drugs as long as you happy you got money in your pocket right you getting your cars and, and your clothing and whatever you want but it's at the demise of your brother. Is, is that good? No. Right? So it says we the hate. That's what abhor means. Right? In verse 9. Abhor that which is evil. Right? Cleave to that which is good. So let's get a precept on that. Let's go to John 3. Right? Let's begin with the author and finisher of our faith. Right? Jesus Christ. He's the one that's going to teach us what is good and what is evil. Right? He's our example. So that way we're not, you know, making a list and then that's that's the things that I deem to be evil. And then the brother's list is different from mine. Right? And the same thing with, with us defining what good is. Oh, let's go to the source of, of how we holy, how we righteous, how we good in the sight of the Most High. Let's begin with the Son of the Most High that came from the bosom of the Father to reveal the will of the Father unto us. Right? Let's read John 3 and we'll begin with... The 19th verse. And hold uh, Romans 12. We'll go back to that in a, in a bit. So let's, let's read John. Gospel of John. The third chapter. Verse 19. It says, And this is the condemnation. Right? What is condemnation? What, what does condemnation mean? To be condemned. Is that a good thing? <laughs> is that a blessing? Is that something to, to rejoice in? Uh, this is the the judgment towards who? The, the righteous? When? The unrighteous, right? And so it says, and this is the condemnation. So let's let's read the 18th verse and then we'll we'll read it from 19. Because it's going into because of this one thing, this is what would bring condemnation. This would bring destruction upon Israel. Those that did not believe, right? And we're going to read it. John three eighteen. Believe on who? On Christ, Jesus Christ, that was sent by the Father to reveal the will of the Father unto us so that we may be saved from what? Our sins. But not all Israel is going to want to be saved in that sense, right? And it's going to be based on their actions. It's going to be based on the choices, the decisions that they make, right? So let's read John 3, 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned. See that? See, so how do we avoid destruction? And that destruction is, is really referring to what? Day, judgment day. Right? When, when, when Christ is sent by the Father to destroy this wicked world, Right? The things that are, are in this wicked world, right? And then to establish the new heavens and the new earth, wherein righteousness is going to dwell, right? So where is the wicked going to stand in that? Where is the wicked part in that new world, the new heavens and the new earth that's going to be established, which is the kingdom of heaven at the second coming of Christ? Where will the wicked appear? Well, they're going to be appearing in that fire, in this very condemnation that we're reading here, because of what? The verse says... He that believeth on him 
right, is not condemned, but he that believeth not, right, is condemned already. <laughs> so you just, you, you alive, you breathing, but lest you repent, you are already marked for fire. You are already marked for that evil that Christ is going to bring forth unto those, unto those that did not believe and repent, right? And then what does um, Mark 19 says in regards to that? As far as the believing, what, what is also involved in believing? That goes similarly to uh, Matthew 28 and Luke 24. The commandment that Christ gave to his disciples right before he ascended to sit at the right hand of the most high and power and the glory. What did he command them? As he would return unto them to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth. What was what was their job going to be? As far as in the ministry, what were they commanded? What was they commanded by Christ to preach unto Israel? The gospel of Christ and repentance. The gospel of Christ and repentance. Right, my brother said the gospel of Christ, right, and repentance, right. But give give more. I said Mark nineteen, but Mark sixteen. Mark sixteen, right? Mark sixteen. Sorry about that. So that goes right along with Matthew twenty eight and Luke twenty four, right? And so, we just read in regards to those that believe, right, would be saved from that condemnation. But those that believe not is condemned already. So, what goes hand in hand? And when the gospel of Christ, right, a gospel of based on repentance in Christ is being preached unto Israel, right? What is the expectation from the Most High for those that amongst Israel that's for, which is all of us, all of us walking in our sins, right? We need to repent, right? And that repentance, and beginning that process of, of repenting, which is go, going into what? Putting off the dead works, putting off sins, right? And not continuing those sins any longer, right? What else is tied to that? Baptizing water, right? For remissions of sins, right? That's why, I'm, let's, let's read it. Let's hold it real quick. Let's go to Mark 16. And let's read. Verse 15 and 16. Because right? you may have those um, amongst Israel, right? They may know that they're Israel, right? And they, they're preaching. They're coming with the scriptures, right? And then they, they're preaching that we have to repent and believe upon Christ. But that's as far as where it stops, right? But they don't believe in, in being baptized in water for remissions of sin. Right? I mean, being baptized is under whose name? As far as under whose power and authority? Because you have some that baptized, right? But Christ told the commanded disciples to, to baptize Israel by what spirit? By, by the, 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 the brother's spirit? Your general? Your pastor? Your preacher? We're to, we, we to baptize Israel in the name of who? The Father, right, which is the Heavenly Father in the heavens, right, which is the power of all heaven and earth, right, and then, and under the Son, who's the Son? Jesus Christ of Nazareth, right? It's, there's no other name, right, under heaven given amongst men wherein we're to be saved, right? So we have to stress that as well. It's not under your preacher, it's not under your pastor, your so-called general, all these flattering titles that, that men like in promoting other men like to give unto them, right? And then what else? It's not just the Father. The Son means Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Who's the, ter who's, who's the third entity that agreed in one that Israel is to be baptized under and believe under? The outpouring of who? The Holy Spirit. Right, which is the most high in, in Christ's spirit returning unto the believers, be, beginning with the disciples. Right, so that's the power and authority in which we're to preach repentance unto Israel and to baptize them in water for remissions of sin. So let's read it here, Mark sixteen fifteen, and he said unto them, "Who's who's the heat? Who's 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 about to speak here? Christ, right? In what time frame are we talking here?"
So after his death, you said he was amongst the disciples. So what else happened? You, you, you kind of skipped some key events, right, after Christ's death. He was risen. He was uh, manifested himself to the apostles. Right. Before he gave him. Right. Exactly. So the brother said after Christ was dead and buried, right, for three days and three nights, he was risen. By the, and how was Christ risen? <laughs> Who rose Christ from the from the dead? The most, the most High, right? And He was risen in power and glory, right? Because it was not possible that He should be holding of that death in the grave, right? Because Christ believed in the Father, He did the will of the Father, He trusted in the Father, right? And then, as a blessing, the Most High kept His word. <laughs> the Most High kept His promise. And when rose Christ from the dead in power and glory, right? And then he was seen with the disciples for 40 days. And you read that in the, in the book of Acts, Acts, the first chapter, right? And so this is the same thing as far as this, this is the same um, uh, account that you read in, in Matthew 28 as well as Luke 24. And then now, according to the gospel of Mark, we're reading it here, right? So all the scriptures are great. And so... This is Christ now as he's with the disciples and he's going into, when you read Luke 24, into the writings of Moses, right? The first five books in the Bible. And then he's going into the Psalms of David and he's going into the writing of the prophets that you'll read in the Old Testament scriptures, right? And then he's going into the prophecies that, he, that all these men, right? Being, uh, being, driven right being guided of the spirit of the most high to write of the things of the prophecies concerning christ that he had to fulfill right leading unto his death burial and resurrection right and so he's teaching that he's opening up the hearts and understanding of the, the disciples because that's that spirit they was going to need after christ would eventually ascend to sit at the right hand of the most high and then christ would return unto them through the outpouring of the holy spirit and you read that in acts the second chapter right and so this is what he's commanding them as far as this is that mission. This is going to be that ministry after Christ would ascend, right? He says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. See, now people read this and then now they, they, they play word association, right? When they see world and then they see every creature, right? So who's, who in the world... What people amongst all the nations in the world, right, or amongst all the creatures that's in the world that the, the disciples were commanded to preach repentance unto? The who? Israel. Israel, right? That's the people that Christ came to save, his own people, right? That's why, that's why Moses in Deuteronomy 18 prophesied concerning Christ, the prophet would be sent by the Most High, Right? To be a savior, to be a salvation for his people, right? and Christ would be born out of his, the uh, out of the lineage of his own people, right? Out of the seed of David, right? And David, who's who's David's father, as far as tribe, Judah, right? And so, what 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 nation did Judah come out of? Was was Judah an Edomite, an Ishmaelite, Israel. Israelite, right? He comes from David, I mean, from, from Israel, which formerly his name was Jacob. And the father, the Most High changed Jacob's name to Israel, which means he is a prince of the power, right? So that, that's a great title to have as far as being part of the nation, being an offspring, a seed of the nation of Israel, right? That's the same nation that Christ is of. And so Christ would be a savior to his people. And so when the gospel was, was preached, the as far as repentance for Israel to be saved from their sins through Christ, that message was to be what? Projected at who? That very nation that Christ came to die for, the nation of Israel. So that's who he's referring to when he's rereading here, go ye in all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Right? Because repentance is for what? Salvation is for the nation that the Most High chose to be his people from the very beginning, from the time that he created Adam. And in all the nations, Right? All the families of the earth, the Most High has always chosen that one seed, that one nation, which is Israel. 
And that's never changed. Most high is always constant with that. Right? And then let's read 16. He that believeth, right? So that's that same message that we Christ out of his own mouth was speaking in John the third chapter. Right? He that believeth, believeth on who? What did we read it in John the, the third chapter? Because there, there's a doctrine tied to the belief, right? It's not a religion. It's not something, a doctrine that's set up by man, man's philosophies, man's traditions. No, believing on Christ that was set by the Heavenly Father to reveal the will of the Heavenly Father unto, right? That's what we're to believe on. And that's why, I, let, let's continue. And it says, and is baptized, see? So believing on Christ to be the salvation, to be Israel's leader, Israel's master, Israel's high 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 priest, right? By his blood we save, right? It says, and is baptized. So what is this baptism here referring to? Baptized by the word, baptized by, by the Holy Spirit here? Right, this is referring to what? Baptized in water for remission of sins, right? And then beginning in Acts, the second chapter, right? During the Feast of Pentecost, right? First fruits, you see that come into pass, right? And it continue on until when? Did it, did it phase out as far as preaching baptism? I mean, preaching repentance unto Israel and, and baptizing in water? How are we taking one part, right? So the, the repentance, preaching repentance doesn't stop. And I'm saying this for a reason because you have some groups, you know, namely amongst our people. Israelite groups, right? That, that, that claim they're preaching repentance in, in Christ's name. Right? But then they're admitting the, the same commandment. Part of the commandment to preach repentance also involves baptizing Israel in water for remission of sin. Right? So we're in this scripture here or any of the other scriptures that we read, well, continuing the preaching repentance part, but then omit baptizing Israel in war. But if you fall in after man's doctrine, right, philosophies of men, men promoting themselves, right, traditions of men, then now, oh yeah, then we, we being like a parrot and repeating things, and, and it's not justified, right? It's not proven out of the scriptures. In saying water baptism is is an option. <laughs> well, you can't do it, brother, but it doesn't make you any more righteous. Where do you read that in the scriptures? Oh, you can't do it, but it's an option. Or some groups teach that you shouldn't do it at all. If you if you preaching water baptism, you preaching the white man's Christianity. <laughs> you preaching the devil's doctrine. So just because the nations, beginning with the so-called white man Esau, that's his nationality out of the scriptures, and any other nation that, that take on the Bible, they take hold of the Bible and try to inject themselves in being the people of the Bible, right, as far as the people that most high through Christ is going to save, we know, we understand it to be Israel, right, and then they claim themselves, they could, they're either the actual Israelites or they could be spiritual, spiritual Israelites, but there's no such thing as a spiritual Israelite. Any Israelite that's spiritual, first and foremost, have to be what? One of the seed of Israel, <laughs> right? And then we understand that what? Through, through grace and mercy, through Christ we save. That's what's making us spiritual. But you can't be a non-Israelite and then try to say now you could be saved. You could believe, you could call upon Christ, and then at the second coming of Christ, right along with Israel to be saved, the other nation is going to join hands with them. That's doctrine, that's false doctrine set up by men to deceive men, right? To deceive, namely, the people of the most out of the true Israelites out of the scriptures, right? But nowhere, as far as making those points, nowhere does it teach us that we could admit the water baptism, right? Because in Matthew 28, right, didn't Christ say, lo, he's going to be with the disciples, with the believers, that's preaching repentance and baptism in Christ's name until when? Until the year 1600, 1700, until when would the preaching of repentance and that when water baptism be completed? 
But what does it say in the scriptures? There, there's a there's a there's a, a wording that says it. All right. So we know as far as the time frame. Right. But let's finish this and then we'll get it. All right. And then we have to we have to um, expound on that because some people will read that, but then by false teachings and false doctrine, false interpretation of the scriptures, then they either start adding to the scriptures or taking away from the scriptures. And then you have people believing it and teaching it wrong unto others, right? And then, truly, you teach a men to sin because the scriptures tell us Christ out of his own mouth said, he that believe it and is baptized shall be saved. Right? And we know that the saving of our souls is what? Until Christ comes, until the end. Whether the end of our life, when we pass away, we bury, but we die having done the will of God, believing. We died in faith, right? Or, if for those that are alive at Christ's coming, right? They found by Christ doing the will of God, right? Keeping the most high through Christ's commandments in faith, right? That's when now the saving of our souls is going to take place, right? When the judgment, judgment day, the books are open by the books, meaning the most high through Christ is keeping tabs, is keeping records on everything that we do, right? How we live our life, the things we speak, right? The things we entertain, right? Whether it be good or whether it be evil. So we're going to have to give answer in that day, right? And those that are found to, to, to have been walking and, and, and living out their life and believing in Christ, right? And we understand to believe on Christ involves what? Because we could say all day we'll believe. What, what are the actions that's, that has to be tied to our belief? belief? Believing is going into our faith. Trusting in, in, in the Father through Christ. Which means what? We have to show it in what? Actions. Our works. Right? That's why Christ said that what? In order for him to return unto us, right? Him and the Father to make their abode with, with the believers, we have to be doing what? There's a key thing we have to be doing right? when you read John 14. If you love me, keep my what? Keep my commandments, right? Well, I thought Christ did away with the commandments. I thought it's all about faith and grace and mercy. It's all about the love in your heart. We, we no longer are under the commandments. We don't have to keep the commandments, no. Now, there's some commandments that were reformed, right? Like the, the Levitical priesthood, like a lot of the, the commandments and, and the statutes tied to uh, the animal sacrifice for atonement of sins. That was done away with, right? Until the time of Reformation. When, and that was replaced by what? Now Christ, having died on the cross, right? Becoming Israel's land that was going to take the sin of the world. The world going into Israel in the world, right? Whether those in the past, present, during the time of Christ's ministry, and those to come afterwards, right? So that one time that Christ died on the cross covers the sins of all Israel. But one key thing that what we must do as believers, we're reading it here. Believe in what? And baptize in water for remissions of sin. And then now, Christ returning unto the disciples as well as the rest of the believers through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And that's that spirit that's going to encourage us, that's going to give us the ability to refrain from sin, right? And do the will of the Father and keep his commandments through faith in Christ. And it says, so the latter part of the verse is, but he that believeth not shall be damned, right? So, and not believing is also tied into what? What we read of the, the beginning of the verse. Because we could claim we believe him, but then we're not preaching. We ourselves are not being baptized in water. Or we're not preaching unto others that it's necessary for them to believe. Not only believe, but to also what? Follow through with the whole commandment that Christ gave unto his disciples. Also being baptized, right? By the power of the Most High. The Son, meaning Jesus Christ himself, and the Holy Spirit. So there's a doctrine tied to the believing, and it is a doctrine tied to what? To being baptized in water, right? So we can't just have anybody baptize us, and then what doctrine are y'all of? What, what doctrine are you preaching, right? What's the basis of your doctrine? And then they're preaching something contrary to what Christ taught the disciples, right? They're not preaching the apostles' doctrine. No, that, that person is not to baptize you, <laughs> right? Because... The disciples wasn't preaching their own doctrine. When they were healing, when they were doing all of those miracles, they was doing it. They was acknowledging that what it was done by the power and authority 
given unto Christ by the Heavenly Father, by them, right? By the, most, by the power of the Most High through Christ are they standing here doing all these great works and great miracles and preaching the gospel, right? So it was not of Peter, right? It wasn't Peter's doctrine, Matthew's doctrine, James, John, right? All the disciples, Philip, right? And then later on, Paul added into the faith. Timothy, Titus, right? Barnabas, it was not of themselves, right? They knew that what? The foundation of that doctrine began with what? Christ. It was all about preaching Christ unto them. Repent, repenting, right? Putting off dead works, putting off our sins, believing on Christ, and then being baptized in water for remissions of sins, and then continuing it, right? Even unto the end, and the ladder of the blessing being what? Salvation, right? The crown of life that the Father promised unto those that love him. It says, so, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So that's that damn condemnation that we're going to, let's go back to, to John 3, that Christ here, during his ministry, was, was preaching unto the disciples and the believers, and then the same commandment that he gave unto them, as they were to continue in the ministry, right? Not having Christ there presently face to face with them, but still being driven, right? By the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Because Christ promised unto them he would not leave them comfortless. He would return unto them. Right? So all these great works, the preaching, the doctrine, is not changing now. Now that Christ has ascended to sit at the right hand of the, the Father in power and glory. It's still going to continue through Christ. By Christ. Of Christ. Right? And that's how Israel would be taught repentance. That's how they would be taught the gospel. That's how they would be taught the commandments of the Heavenly Father. It was going to be Christ speaking to these men. All right? So let's go back to John 3. John 3. So the reason that we went to Mark 16. So let's read it again in John 3 and 18. All right? That's because in reading the believer here, it's tied to what? Or the baptism. It's one of the same. All right? It goes hand in hand. So John 3, 18. He that believeth on him, on him being who? The Christ that was sent by the Heavenly Father, right? Christ didn't come to do his own will, but the will of the Father that sent him, right? It says, but he that believeth, well, let's read it from the first verse again, from the top. He that believeth on him is not condemned, right? Why would you not be condemned if you believe? Because you're pleasing, you're doing the will of God. You're doing the will of Christ, right? So how, how could, could we find, find punishment, right? Or, or, or judgment when we're doing the will of God, right? Was, was Christ promoting wickedness, promoting the, the breaking of the Most High's commandments? No. As Christ walked, so ought we to walk, right? Which is in the keeping and pleasing the Father, keeping the commandments of the Father, right? And so it says, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So what does it mean that the condemnation is going to be due to the fact that they don't believe in the name of the only begotten Son of God? What is the name? Because some people will read that and then take that and run with it and saying, see, it says you got to believe in the name. So you got to know the name. You got you to know how to say the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth in the Hebrew. Right? You can't call him by Jesus or Jesus Christ or Jesus Christo or any type of translation, right? That's not directly tied to Hebrew. Right? Is that what Christ was stressing here? That we have to know, we have to be able to say and pronounce his name in the Hebrew? Right. So it was referring to the power and authority, right? That was restored unto Christ after his death and resurrection by the Father. He was resurrected in what? In power and glory. So when we when we reading here, Christ is saying, He hath not where it says, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Meaning the power and authority that what? That was due unto Christ. Right? So Christ 
is the author and finisher of our faith. All right? So we have Christ is the source that determines as far as how we are to walk. Right? What is required of us in, in regards to pleasing God. That's what it means by that. Because the scripture mentions that what? The Most High gave Christ the preeminence over all things. Right? The angels in the heavens, there's none greater than Christ aside from the Most High. Right? Man on earth, beast, the winds, spirits, Satan himself, everything was, its, it's, it's source is of who? Christ. Right? So we have to what? Humble ourselves unto who? Christ. So if, if someone is speaking, well, you're not saying Christ's name. So what is the true Hebrew? Even if we knew the true Hebrew, right? The Pharisees knew the Hebrew. The high priests knew the Hebrew. They knew how to say God's name in the Hebrew and Christ's name in the Hebrew. Was that what was they? What was was that what they were lacking? To where, for those that didn't repent in Christ, as far as in, in receiving the judgment, is that what they were missing? No. So it's referring to what? Not believing, not calling upon Christ, the power and authority that was given unto Christ to be saved from our sins, right? Because when you read the examples. What was they setting before the Most High during Christ's ministry? Well, as far as what was they setting and, and putting as a precedence and in claiming themselves to be sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? They're quoting scriptures. They're quoting the Moses. They're quoting the Psalms of David, right? But then who, who are they excluding? And then on top of that, Christ out of his own mouth mentions that Abraham didn't exclude Christ. Moses didn't exclude. He, he mentioned in the scriptures, if you believed in what Moses wrote, you would have believed on me, meaning Christ said on him being Christ, because who did Moses write of? Concerning who, of who? Did Moses write of himself? Did Isaiah in many of the scriptures, did he write of himself? The, the, Psalms, the Psalms of David, did he write of himself? When, when, when David in Psalms 110 and 1 says, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit down at my right hand until I make thine enemies at first two. Right? And then Christ went into that and I want to say what, Matthew 22? Was, 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 was David writing that of himself? No. Christ mentioned that what? David being in the spirit. Right? Wrote that concerning who? That's why he cut the, the Pharisees. He, you saying that the Lord... Is this, his father is David, then he said, well, then how doth David in the spirit said, the Lord said unto my Lord. So David is referring to Christ as his Lord. Well, wait a minute. I, I thought y'all saying that Christ is David's son. How, how, how is the father calling the son Lord? Because David knew ultimately Christ preceded him. Christ's days are of all and everlasting. Christ was with the father before the world was. Christ was always with the Father. He has no, no beginning of days, no end of days. Right? So David being in this, that's why he was in the Spirit. <laughs> he was moved by the Holy Spirit when he was writing that. So for all the prophets, including David, gave what? The praise and glory unto who? Christ, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. But then you would have those that would praise men. High priest so-and-so. Right? Unless you learn at the footsteps of this high priest or this man or this doctor of the law, then you cannot be saved. And they preaching, didn't we command you not, not to preach in this man's name, referring to Jesus Christ unto the disciples? And then disciples, they following through with the commandment that Christ gave unto them. <laughs> we're not going to be fearful of men. We're, gonna, we're not going to now, you know, bow down and, 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 and be afraid of the face of men. And not go through with the commandment that Christ gave unto them. Right? And Christ had already told them they was going to suffer persecution. They was going to be hated of all men. Right? And they understood it because of the, the faith that, that they truly believe in the Father through Christ. And they was moved to the Holy Spirit. Even if it meant, and many times they would be what? Beaten, whipped, thrown into prison. Some of them got killed. Right? For preaching the gospel. But they knew what? They had a, a, a greater prize at hand for them, a greater blessing at the second coming of Christ, right? Receiving the end of what? Their faith, 
which is eternal life at the second coming of Christ. So now let's read verse 19. And this is the condemnation. Right? This is what's further going to condemn Israel, right? So that they have no excuse. Meaning by Israel, meaning the wicked of Israel, those that did not repent, right? Those that are choosing to follow some other doctrine, some other ways of life, some worldliness, right? And setting Christ aside, right? Later for Christ. So this is what's going to condemn them. It says that light is come into the world. See, so the previous verses, Christ is referring that he's the son being sent of God, right? But now he's saying in a different wording, right? He's still speaking of himself, right? Being sent of God by the, of the, by the heavenly father. But he's referring to himself as what? The light, right? It says that light is coming to the world. So what? And it, so let's read on. It says, and men love darkness rather than light. See, because their deeds were evil. See? So when you are in darkness, what do you need to see? Light, right? And so it, it, Christ is saying this symbolically, right? Not, oh, yeah, so you need a flashlight. You need to light a candle. You need to turn the light on, to turn on the light switch. Well, Christ is referring to himself, meaning the light. He's good. He's righteous. He's holy. He's just. He's perfect. That's what the light is referring to. And then what else is in the world that's making it to, to be deemed as darkness, right? Is it referring to at night is dark? To, oh, wait a minute. Is, is that the, the, the difference of light and dark that Christ is referring to? Like in the daytime, there's light, and in the evening, the, at night is darkness? So what is the darkness tied unto? Symbolically, spiritually, as Christ is speaking about it here. It says, and men love darkness, right? It's just saying that men, well, I like, well, I like the nighttime. Well, I like the daytime when there's light. No, symbolically, the light represents good righteousness, the keeping of the Most High's commandments, right? Being holy, being perfect, like the Most High in Christ is perfect. That's what the examples we should be, what? Setting our eyes towards, right? But men, so what type of men would love darkness rather than the light? Evil, Evil men, wicked men, carnal men. Men, that's, that's about what they see. Present present day, present life. Right? The, jo the joys and taking pleasures in wickedness and breaking the Most High's commandments, right? Be it idolatry, be it fornication, be it murder, be it hatred, right? Being, being indulgent in, 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 in their lust, right? So carnal men, worldly men, right? And really, we know the world as far as the other nations, their God is what? Idols. <laughs> but who's, who's the God of, of, of Israel? The, who's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? The Most High, the Heavenly Father, right? And how many gods are there? <laughs> is it this nation, Israel has one God and then the other nations have their gods? No. The Heavenly Father is the God of all heaven and earth. There's none besides the Most High. Right? There's no other gods that could challenge the Most High, right? He's the, he's the power he's of all heaven and earth. And he's the power of who? One specific group of people, one nation, right? Israel, right? And so you would have many wicked men, right? Well, we might read a couple examples of the behaviors of some of the wicked men that would choose to be like the nations, and to be like the nations, meaning they want to follow after the lifestyle, the wicked things that the world, the wicked people in this world follow through, right? Conform like them, be like them, dress like them, talk like them, behave like them, right? And so these type of wicked men, they love darkness, meaning they love sins. They, they love breaking the commandments of the Most High because that's what the nations are about, right? Rather than what? Rather than choosing to follow after Christ, to believe in Christ. Right? Believe it upon, on, on, on the preaching of the gospel, which is salvation through Christ, repenting from the breaking of the Most High's commandments and believing on Christ, and then also what? Being baptized, as we read in Mark 16. So they chose, they choosing the darkness, they choosing wickedness, they, they choosing 
the breaking of Heavenly Father's commandments and choosing to what? Repent and believe on Christ. It says because, see, their deeds, see, it goes back to what? So what, what are your deeds? What, what's the deed? Things that you do, right? Your works, right? So beginning with the mind, because that's what Christ out of the heart perceived, what? Evil thoughts, right? So murders, adultery, fornication, idolatry, all that proceeds from the mind. So if, if you are, if you walking in a wicked mind, you meditating on wicked things, you're thinking about wicked things, even before you do it, if you're not purging the wicked spirits and, and, and calling on the Most High through Christ to give us that Holy Spirit to abstain from all those wicked thoughts, what eventually is going to happen? It's going to lead to what? As we read in here, that deeds be evil. Where the, the, the thoughts now is going to be made manifest by your actions. Right? You're thinking about a fornication. What's, what eventually, and then you're not acknowledging, wait, that's, that's evil thoughts. The scripture says the thoughts of foolishness is said. Christ already said it. If I'm thinking of these things and I'm not praying for the most high to, to take away that evil, wicked spirit, these wicked thoughts, it's only a matter of time before now what? Like you read it in James, the first chapter. How, how is man, uh, a man or a woman given over to, to sin? How does it begin? How, how is a man tempted to do evil? When he is drawn away, what? The, 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 the lust that's in your mind. You give place to it, then what eventually is going to happen? When it's conceived, the, the wicked thoughts is, you going sometimes one minute, two minutes, five minutes, one day, two days, three days, or months. What eventually happens when now you almost accepting these thoughts as if it's, it's normal? It's, it's good behaviors. What eventually is going to happen? Well, most is going to try us, right? That's what scripture says, let no man say that when he is tried, that what? What does the scripture say in James 1? You all remember that scripture? Which is one of them scriptures out of the many that we go through all the time. And that's something that we experience every day of our life, Right? Because Satan don't sleep. Satan's doing his job. He's walking the earth to and fro, seeking whom we may devour. So we're not meditating on the scriptures like, how did I just end up cursing out my brother? Or how did, did I end up, you know, breaking this commandment, that commandment? Was it just out of the blue? Like, like you had no control over it? It just happened that the, the, the idea was presented and you just ended up doing it? Let's read. Let's hold this real quick. Let's get James 1. James 1 and 12. And then we'll go back to John 3. This is James 1, verse 12. Because we just read in, in John 3 that the condemnation is because there would be those amongst Israel, right? Even though that they had that opportunity, that's why scripture says that light is coming. See, light is coming to the world. So the judgment, when, when the judgment books are open and a man is being judged for being a fornicator or a murderer, an idolater, I, I, his excuse is not going to be, I never knew. See, every man is going to get an opportunity. Right? Because Christ said it. That's the condemnation. Light is coming to the world. So at some point in every man, in every woman's life, right, even including the children, right, the will of the Father through Christ is going to be revealed unto them. So that way there's no excuse to where, but Christ, I, I never knew. Nobody told me that fornication was wrong, murder was wrong, idolatry was wrong, hating my brother it, it was wrong. No, at the end of the day, there's going to be an opportunity that's going to be given unto all Israel, right? To repent at the preaching of the gospel. Now, what they choose to do with that is going to be on them. Whether they're going to humble themselves, believe, be baptized in water for remissions of sin, and then continue on to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit until the day of Christ, or they're going to take that and, and then what? Discount it. Now, that's, that's your belief. That's your scripture. That's your Sabbath. Well, 
we're going to see what Christ has to say, right? Comes judgment day, right? Because Christ is the ultimate judge, right? So let's read James 1 and 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, see? So now in, 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 in the Father through Christ calling us in, in this faith to be saved, right? Because Christ is the one that's doing the choosing. Right? And so as he's calling us and he's making us all of us be members of his body in this church, the church meaning Christ being a church, not this physical building, not my church, your church, the church over here. No, the church is the body of Christ, the believers of Christ that's being called into the faith of Christ to be saved. Right? So as we're being called, right, as the believers to be saved, what's going? what are we going to encounter? When we, after we've got, you know, we're believed, right? We're in the process of, of, of putting off dead works through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, right? We got baptized. What comes, <coughs> what comes with that? Is it now a yellow brick road to the kingdom? Everything's going to be easy because we, we get up in the morning, we pray, we're in the scriptures, we, you know, we fellowship on the Sabbath days. What else is going to come with that? And, and, and believing in the most high through Christ. Brother said it. Right? Temptation. My son, if thou come to serve the Lord, right, prepare thy soul for what? Temptation. And Christ himself was not exempt from these temptations. Well, Christ never went through it. Christ never, you know, had to endure, you know, not giving place over to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. That's just a summary of everything, how Satan's going to come. Right? Directly after Christ was baptized, Most High led him into the wilderness for 40 days to be what? Tempted straight up by the devil. And that was not the only time that Christ was tempted. Throughout Christ's whole ministry, day in, day out, different opportunities. Whether Satan was coming at Christ directly or he was coming through what? Through situations, through people, right? Whether amongst his disciples, whether amongst the Pharisees, whether against the scribes, right? Whether against, you know, the nations, Pilate, Herod, to, to, to tempt Christ to see if Christ is going to bend scriptures, if Christ is going to do something to please himself, to, to see if Christ is going to make, you know, situations easy for himself, but then at the same time break the commandments of the Most High. And none of these temptations that Christ failed, right? And we, we, we sometimes fail like the smallest temptations, right? And Christ endured the, the death of the, on, on the cross. How many of us on the cross, and then you got your own people, your own nation surrounding you, <laughs> cursing you out, making mockery, snickering, laughing, right? Doing all these evil things. And then we on that cross looking down at like, man, later for this guy, later for these folks, right? Christ could have called at any point, caused legions of angels, right, to get him out of that situation. But what? That would have been his will and not the will of the Father, right? And so scriptures tell us that what Christ was tempted in all points, right, in Hebrews, as we are, but what? Yet without sin. Just anything, any temptation, any trial that we could go through, whether you know somebody else has went through it, ailments, infirmities, or sickness, anything. Oh, but it doesn't actually say Christ went through it. Scriptures tell us that the, the works that Christ did was so innumerable that even all the volumes of the books in the world could not even contain them. <laughs> just, just think of all the books that man has wrote from like the beginning of days till now. That couldn't be, that couldn't even account of everything that Christ did. Right? But we, we, we trust, we believe in the scriptures that most I says all points in every situation and in, in every circumstance but I don't see the one where was Christ tempted with adultery, like where a woman was coming on to Christ. And I read Joseph went through something like that. Well, scripture says he was tempted in all points. Rest assured that Christ could not be the author and finisher finish of our faith. How could Christ console us into something that he has no experience in? Well, I have a lot of hatred thoughts and, you know, I, I, I just, you know, I, I, I get weak when I'm going through temptations. I lose hope, you know. I turn to drugs, I turn to alcohol, or, you know, just 
Like, but how could Christ console us into these things when he's never explained? How could Christ relate? Right? So he had to have gone through every by going through it meaning not fulfilling the lust of the flesh, giving over to oh yeah, I've experienced it, so I know what this brother's going through. No. Meaning the temptations came unto Christ. As we're reading it, blessed is the man that has endured temptation. See? And who was the, the greatest of all that that could claim that to where something we we could say, oh, we pat ourselves in the back. Oh, yeah. That's Satan. I saw Satan coming. Uh, that guy here, he's trying to get me out of the spirit. The guy at my job, the woman at my job, my supervisor. Uh, I was at the supermarket and, and people was, was you know, got spirits on them. The so-called holidays are coming around and they got... It was trying to tempt me. It was trying to provoke me to sin. I stayed in the spirit. All, right, all praises. All side through Christ gets the glory. Continuing that, right? But now, who's the only one that could claim in everything, every temptation, every single day, every single minute, where he's not even thinking about the foolishness and then, you know, like, like reveling in the, in the wicked thoughts. We catch ourselves, right? I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. Most high, forgive me. Oh, brother, sister, forgive me. Right? Now once this, did Christ have to, Father, I, I, I've sinned. Have mercy on me. Oh, because Christ trusted in the God. And so Satan could never have dominion over Christ. Right? Because Satan couldn't get his foot in the door once to begin with, let alone two, three times, ten times. Right? And so as, as believers of Christ, as ministers of Christ, right, as servants of Christ, right, it says, blessed, this is James 1 and 12, blessed is the man that endureth temptation, right? So when it says blessed, meaning that's the fruit, that's the outcome, right? You receive that blessing, and the ultimate blessing is what? Receiving that crown of life that we're going to read here in the scripture. This is for when he is tried, right? He shall receive the crown of life. So when it says when he is tried, that, that's going into all the temptations, however long our life is going to be, right, that, that we're going to live. It's not, brother, I'm going to receive that crown because I, 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 I endured the temptation today. Well, that means today, tomorrow, next week, next month, if we live to be 70, all those days, right? Lord, we'll, we'll, we'll read, maybe, maybe not today, due to due the time, but we're going to read about um, Eleazar, right, in Second Maccabees, the sixth chapter. Right, it would would alias off for those that that knows that situation. Right, when when the Greeks, beginning with Alexander, came into power. When the Greeks ruled the earth, and then they was persecuting one main nation, right, being the nation of Israel, because they're they're the nation that had the righteous and holy commandments of the Most High. That was vastly different than the ways and life of the Greeks, which was wickedness. Right? Scriptures tell us that when they came into power, wickedness, sins, evil multiplied. So the world was already wicked to begin with. Now they, they just brought it onto another level. Exceedingly wickedness was going on, right? And then their target was who? Because all nations gladly say, okay, we'll, we'll follow after Antiochus. We'll gladly be Greeks, Greeks in, in fashion, Greeks in, in ways of life. Because their ways was no different than the Greeks to begin with. Is the so-called Chinese ways, as far as their commandments, their lifestyles, the way they live, their gods, the things that they eat, is it any different than the so-called white man's? The so-called they all they're, they're one and the same. It's wicked. Because to know righteousness, to know what is good, we have to what know the will, the will of the, the Father. We have to know the commandments of the Father. And who was that revealed unto? What nation? The nation of Israel. Right? So when the Greeks came into power, they were compelling Israel. And it wasn't, you have a choice. You know, some gladly followed after the ways of the Greeks in wickedness. And then, you know, those that want to continue as far as Israel, if you want to continue in the commandments, that's fine. No. They were compelling them by force. And it meant if your life had to be taken away, your children had to be killed, your house, your house is burned down, they were doing whatever it, it took to persecute Israel. Right? And then some gladly, even without the persecution, gladly have to follow after the Greeks. And some folded, they bended. They couldn't see themselves going through those temptations, going through those trials, going, going through those evils 
and then, and then trusting that God would save them. They didn't have faith, right? So some, some of them caved in. But many of them, right, you read about Mattathias and his sons, right? Judas and his brethren. And then you had many of Israel that was just like, no, nah, we're not going to bend the commandments of the Most High and, and transgress the Most High's commandments. Even if it means we're going to be persecuted, we're going to be hated, we're going to be driven out of our homes. They gladly what? They accepted. They took on those temptations, those trials, right? And then what's going to be the blessing for them, right? Because Christ hasn't came yet. The Greeks ruled hundreds of years ago, right? Now we're in the year 2023. So Mattathias, his sons died. Many of the believers, they died. So did, did they die in vain? Not having received the promise? No. Because they trust in just like Abraham, Isaac, our forefathers, right? Noah. They all believe and trust that what? They're going to receive it, what? At the second coming of Christ. Right? There's a specific day when that's going to happen. Right? And so that's the blessing that we're reading here. So, so it says, for when he is tried, so all the temptations that the Most High is going to bring forth, as you read in, in Deuteronomy 8, to try us, to prove us, to see whether we love him or no. Right? So all the temptations that we have to look at it as they're, they're challenges. Right? They're challenges by the Most High. And when, when, when we present it with them, we have to look at it in a way where this is the most high, putting something in my path to fail, right? Because one thing that's with the most high through Christ, he's not going to put something in our path that we're not going to be able to deal with, right? What's a good scripture that goes with that? Oh, brother, this one is the toughest one, brother. Like, you would have failed too, brother. You, you would have committed fornication too. You would have dealt idolatry too because... Your life was on, even if our life is on, Scripture tells us that fight for the truth unto death, right? And the Most High is going to fight for us, right? So what's the good Scripture that, that lets us know that all the temptations, right? And then a good one too, when Paul, and I want to say 2 Corinthians 12 chapter, when he was mentioning that there was a given unto him a, 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 a temptation in his flesh, and then he went unto Christ three times with it, right? And then Three times. By three times meaning like that fervent, exceeding prayers. Whatever that's it, it didn't it didn't specify exactly what what the the, the, the temptation that he was dealing with. But it definitely for him to write about it and to mention that this is just something that he has to deal with, what was Christ's response unto him? <laughs> okay, Paul, I'm gonna take this away from you. You know, like rest assured, Paul, you don't have to deal with this temptation no more. What was gonna be Paul's um way to deal with it and to be able to overcome it. Christ told him that what? My grace is sufficient for thee, right? So believe on me, Paul. So for some temptations, for some trials, it's going to be for the extent of our whole life. But brother, I've been praying, I've been praying for, for three years. I've got, you know, like I get anointed, you know, by the elders constantly. You know, I'm examining myself all the time. I'm Asking the most how to show me if I'm doing something wrong. Oh, there's certain temptations. It's for the extent of our whole life, right? But but what is going to be the the comfort, right, to to help us bear through it? And and I'm making reference to that that scripture that I mentioned, in which most high in the scriptures you know, through through the Apostle Paul lets us know as far as the temptations that we're dealing with. We're able to bear it. What, what scripture is that? And I kind of give some clues in that. First Corinthians, the tenth chapter, right? Let's let's hold this. Let's hold James. Let's get First Corinthians, the tenth chapter. See, so it it needs to be said because especially when we go into it personally, right? There's times it's, it's easy. You giving someone counsel, you know, you comforting somebody, you know, hey brother, here's, here's five scriptures that comes to mind with the situation that you're dealing with. Yeah, brother, I, I get weak sometimes, you know, or I, I lose patience sometimes. You know, I get weary and well-doing sometimes. All right, here's some scriptures. But now what about when you're going through it yourself, right? Same scriptures, like similar to Job. Job was a comfort to, to many in Israel, right? But then most High brought the heat on Job. Like this this one Job never experienced before. It's was like, whoa, what, what else can go over the next day? And this too, my servants get my sons, my daughters, you know, my, my cattle. 
And then most I get the Job, a lot of Satan to come at Job in his flesh. Man, like, imagine that, like sorrows and pains and anguish and man, like, okay. And then his wife is, hey, curse the most I just get it over with. Most, let the most I kill you, take your life away. Hey, that That's the, your wife, that's supposed to be what? One flesh with you and, and be a tower against death. Even now the wife is getting out the spirit. But those are temptations that Job had to deal with. But Job, you know, ultimately enduring and most are dealing with him and in, in, in a way chastising him to, to show him, Job, you're not perfect. Right? You're going through these through these chastening, through this temptation for a reason, to make a better man out of you. Right? And once Job was able to see that and to understand that this is the will of God, even though he's lost all these things and even though he's being chastened to, to such an extreme fashion, what do we read as far as in the end of the last chapter of Job? What was the, the latter end of Job? It tells you that Most High blessed him double than what he had before. See that? And that's just in Job's present life. What about when Christ comes and then now we're reading about what we just read in James 1. We'll go back to it. As far as blessed is the man that endures temptation for when he has tried, he shall receive the crown of life. See? So Job has a, a greater blessing at hand. Because Job has died. He's in the grave. He's at rest, right? But at the resurrection, he's going to receive what? The crown of life. Right along with all the believers to be saved. Right? So let's get 1 Corinthians 10. We'll read verse 13. Right? Because the point was going into, going back to James 1, which we'll go back to it after the scripture, as far as the temptations that we go through. Right? And the scripture is going to explain it that it's not above and beyond your capability when we deal in through the outpour and we believe we're trusting in god we have having faith in god in christ that what we'll be able to overcome it All right let's read it here first corinthians 10 13. if they have no temptation taken you but such as is common to man see so first and foremost we have to acknowledge that what all the temptations that that may come our way and they will, right? That, that's part of our walk in the faith. Every man, every woman, every child, young brother, young sister, he, or the children, or they, they, don't, they don't go through temptations. Yeah. Have a parent dealing with the, the sons or the daughter, they're going through their temptations, right? And it's applicable to this very scripture that we're reading here, right? It says it's common to all men, right? But the, the son talking to them, Dad, you don't understand. You don't think, understand the stuff that I have to do, the peer pressure with other kids and things like that. They're common to all men. Your, your father wasn't a, a child at one point, right? And now we're talking, which is the, 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 the better assurance of our faith is we're going through the t these temptations being called a servant of the Most High through Christ. See, for many of us, we could remember certain temptations we went through, but we was, we was without the scriptures. We was void of the knowledge of the Most High through Christ. And when we reflect back, the same temptations that we go through now in the world, we would have dealt with it differently. Right? We dealt with it carnal. Right? We was looking at it as, man, that's a freak accident. You know, what, like, you know, what's the other word that they use um, when people go through things and then they, they don't acknowledge this, um, there's a word, uh, like coincidence or something like that, or just they, they, as if things just happen without an a entity, without the most high through Christ behind it. Like stuff is just happening, right? And then you just take it as it comes. Oh well, I hope tomorrow is a better day. You know, I hope I don't. You know, I don't, I don't have to go through this tomorrow. And when you really, most high is directing all our paths, all the ways of men, right? Even when people are doing good, who's behind it? The most high. When people are doing evil, who's behind it? The most high. And nothing going down on the earth. Scripture tells us, shall there be evil in the city, and the Lord hath, the Lord hath not done it. Oh, that was Mother Nature. That was the, the, the fire just like, when, there's a spirit in that fire. There's a spirit in the flood. There's a spirit in the hurricane. Right? There's a spirit in, in the earthquake. Anything going down. There's a spirit in an animal attacking, you know, a, a dog attacking somebody, a lion. Right? Somebody goes in the forest, he's attacked by a, by a bear. But somebody else went in that same forest, nothing happened to him. Who was behind both situations? The Most High through Christ. You know? 
Nothing going out on the earth without the Most High through Christ being behind it. So what does that, what does it mean now for our temptations? <laughs> so they just happening, and or are they happening because the Most High wants you to do it? Like Joseph, right? When 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 um, uh, Potiphar's wife was trying to come on to him, right, and, and try to entice him to 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 fornicate with her, commit adultery with her. Did Joseph look at it as, well, I'm in a perfect situation. I'm in the room with her. Nobody's here. You know, furthermore, my, my brother sold me into captivity here. And, well, maybe the most I forsook me. You know, I, I've been trying to be good all my life. And then where has that gotten me? Right? And now I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a slave in Egypt. Like, what did I do? You could have justified that and, and, and broke the most high commandments and, and fornicated with this wicked woman. Right? But he stayed in the commandments that was taught to him by his father, Jacob, right? Reflecting on the commandments of the Most High and knew that what? That would be great wickedness when you read Genesis 39. He not he, he went beyond it. Like he would have sinned against Potiphar in, in laying down with Potiphar's wife, right? Fulfilling his lust with her. But before we even get to Potiphar, He's like, man, I'm, I'm transgressing the commandments of the Most High. That's this man's wife. That's his. That's his. That's his. That's his woman, right? I can't. I can't break that marriage, even though she's down with it. See, she, she's consenting. He's not trying to force her. Because some people, oh, we two consenting adults. You know what? What's what's the wrong in that? We're not hurting nobody. Well, we're breaking the Most High's command. That's that's great wickedness in the sight of the Most High, which comes with what? Judgment, death. Right? And so let's read 13 again. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. They have no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. So can do we think like that when we're going through temptations? Like do do we say this to ourselves? Like we acknowledge that this is not a strange anomaly. This is like, wow, like I don't think Theo has ever went through that one. Like I don't I don't think, you know, Gabarro you know, Kamari, you know, this brother, this sister. Like, no, no, wait a minute. Whether you know they've done gone through it, or whether maybe they haven't gone through specifically in this temptation, right? But it's common. Some somewhere, somehow, somebody's going through it. Somebody in the church is going through it, right? And if even if you don't know who, we know for sure that Christ was tempted in this fashion, right? But Christ endured. And that's why he received the blessing from the Father in what? Restoring the power, the, 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 the same power that he had. You know what I'm saying? The, the same, you know, uh, 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 power and authority that he had with the Most High before the world was. And Most High resurrecting him from the dead. Right? And so, let's read on. It says, but God is faithful. See? So, who's, who's with us in a temptation? Who's right there? Like, like watching, he's aware of the temptation. It ain't like most. Oh man, like who's going through this sickness, this ailment, this infirmity, this persecution, and then like then then most I catches up a week later. Well, I didn't know you was going through that. I could have saved you from that. No, the scripture says, "But God is faithful," right? Meaning God is true. God is not gonna say, "Keep my commandments and live," right? And then at at some point, whether it be two days a week. Somehow forgot about it, that you're going through a temptation, you're going through a trial. It says, but God is faithful. He's always there. God is always, he's, his spirit is what? The scripture says is um, omnipotent, meaning it's everywhere. It's, it's like all, there's not one corner in this world where the most high spirit can't be found. Like you could go into the depths of the seas, into the heavens, into the skies, into outer space. Most high spirit is everywhere, in the caves, in the mountains, right? And so no matter where you're going through with that, that temptation, God is faithful. He says, who will not suffer you, meaning will, will not allow you, right? That's what not suffer is going to not allow you to be tempted above, see that? Above that ye are able. So it's, 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 most high is, is, is dishing out the temptations, meaning the, the trials, just right brother i got this this element this they're telling me it's uh it's 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 critical right 
Like there's there's no cure for this. There's, this is cancer. Brother, you never went through cancer. But you read this script. But God is faithful, will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. Brother, can you relate to cancer? You know, can can liver, this, whatever it is. Doctors tell me I got 30 days to live. Well, you know what? That's that's the days the most I said, whether it's 30 days, whether it's another year you get to live, five. Most High determines, right, the length of days, right? And however way, whether someone will die in their sleep, somebody will die, you know, in a hospital, some, someone will die in old age. However way the situation is, right, we're going to have to what? Believe and trust in the Most High. Like, we're not going to trust in man, put our faith in man. And the temptations, it's letting us know to, to what? To not lose hope. Now we were like, why should I pray? Why, why should I call the Most High for help? Like, I've been going through this for five years, for 10 years, for 20 years. Right? Scripture says what? The Most High being faithful will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. So, brother, sister, and trusting in the Most High, trusting in Christ, going about it in faith, going about it in patience, you could overcome this temptation. Right? And by overcoming, it doesn't mean that necessarily mean most high is gonna take it away, right? Because like Paul, like the most high Christ told Paul, my my grace is sufficient for you. You believe and you trust, and even if it means Paul, you die with this infirmity, right? But die in faith, die believing in me, right? Because are we gonna be risen as far as those that's gonna be risen to live eternally? Are they gonna be risen to with the same ailment, infirmity, the disease? Is there going to be any death and sorrows and pain in Christ's kingdom? No. See, so we, we take it as, you know what? That's when sent into this, into this world, there came the sorrows, there came the anguish, there came the, the nations being above us, right? So because beginning with Adam and Eve and transgressing the commandments of the Most High, sin into the, into the world. And then with sin came what? Judgment for sin. Sorrows, pains, anguish, right? Infirmities, persecutions, and even leading unto what? Death. But even in death, if we die in faith, right? Believing and trusting in the resurrection of the dead unto eternal life, then what? That's where now we understand whatever it is that we're going through, that's the most high. That's, that's what he's chosen for every single one of us, right? And so go about it, pray. But now understand, there's a difference between if the Most High tempting you, trying you to see whether you love him or not. And then the other side of it is, now you give in into the temptation, right? And then you justifying it, right? Because the temptation is not Most High now urging you or trying to provoke you to sin and then to justify why you sin. Well, Most High controls the ways of man. Like, he could have taken that away. So I committed adultery because the Most High put that in my path. No. He, he's putting the, the, the temptations. It's a test. It's to prove, to prove you whether you're going to what? Love him or not. And Christ, he quoted Deuteronomy 8 chapter. Right? Satan trying to hey, bow down and serve me. Right? Command that these stones be made bread. So now if, if Christ had before, one of them tempted, if you the extent of those days and beyond those days during his ministry, at any point, Christ gives place to Satan. Who would Christ's God be? The Most High or Satan? Satan? Satan, right? Christ would become now a servant to hope, sin. A servant to Satan and not a servant to righteousness being a servant of God, right? And so Christ always knew that. Don't give, don't give an inch, don't give Satan one chance to come in because that's it. Once you open the door, Satan's going to like, now Christ is done. Right? Because now Christ would have went astray from the commandments of the Most High. That's who his father would be, Satan. But now once it's, did Christ do that? To even meditate, to even think about it, to even reflect on what Satan, nah, he's shutting Satan down from the get-go because there's nothing good from Satan. He appears, he makes it appear as good, like he made it appear good unto Eve, right? In the beginning. But it was what? Deceitful lust. It was deceiving. 
right? When we've been carnal, we we miss out. Wait, wait a minute, like, this is that's not good. You know, th this this persuasion here from Satan here, this idea here. When you really examine it now, that would mean I have to break the Most High's commandments. I'm going to endure that. I'm not going to do that, right? And then we trust that what Most High being faithful. He's putting in every single one of us, whatever the trial, the temptations that we go through, we're able of what? Overcome it. That's what we're going to read here. Let's continue in verse 13, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. But will, with the temptation, right? Also, see, there is, there's always that way that we're going to read. Also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Right? So now, if, if if we're not believing in the Most High through Christ, right? We're not trusting that the temptations that we're going through, it's necessary. Most High setting that up to build us up, to try our faith, right? Are we gonna Are we gonna think about the way to escape? So who's the way to escape? Let's put a name on it. Christ, right? Christ through the outpouring. Christ is not necessarily going to be in person, but he's with he's with us. He's making his abode with us through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That's when you got to call on the Most High, call upon Christ, right? Pray, Lord, like this 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 burden, this temptation is heavy on me. It's heavy on my mind, but I know, Lord, that what Scripture tells us: if we submit ourselves to God, we have to what resist the devil, and in resisting the devil, because in Christ there. These are the steps. Submitting meaning reflecting on the scriptures. We're going every day, we're beginning the day with prayer, right? We're in the scriptures. Any situations, we constantly, okay, scripture's got to be in our mind. We're meditating upon the scriptures, right? We're discerning. Scripture says this. You know, you, you brothers in the store or something, a woman, you know, a brother is married on top of that. And some woman coming on to him, make, giving him compliments. Right? Oh, brother, you, you must work out. And then he's getting already smiling and scriptures out the door. Like, wait, wait a minute. Where's this woman coming up? You know, that's that's Satan automatically. Wait, wait a minute. Instead of, oh, what's your name? What's your number? Oh, you know what? I could teach her the scriptures. Right? Maybe that's the most high of bringing the sister in the faith. <laughs> To you, and, and, and then your step is I'm going to teach her on the side, and then now you're finding yourself fornicating with this woman, right? And we had examples in the in amongst the brothers and sisters in the faith, right? Amongst the church, in which men gave place to fornication, justifying it, right? But what they didn't see it as this is a temptation that the Most High is trying to see what whether I'm going to stay in the commandments or no, right? And so, with the way that we're reading here, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it, right? And the example I brought with Paul, Paul went to that way. He went to Christ. He prayed unto Christ, right? Paul could, whatever that infirmity that was in his flesh, he could have just like, man, I'm, I'm preaching, I'm, I'm being a, 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 a minister to Israel in, in, you know, in, in the world as far as the Gentile state of mind. You know, I'm traveling here, I'm going to this city, that city, this island. You know, I'm forsaken all for Christ, but then I got to deal with this infirmity later for that. Oh, Paul knew, he's like, I got to go to Christ. And then going to Christ, if the if, if Christ is showing you, I will the most high through Christ is going to show us, this is just something you're going to have to bear with. Whether for another week, whether for another month, whether for the, for the extent of your whole life, right, trust in that. Right? Because then the latter part said what? That ye may be what? Able to bear it. Right? How do how how do we know what the length of that time is? Who's the only one that knows how long it is that we're gonna go through that trial? The most high through Christ. But trust that what? And that and in and, and, and going through these temptations, make sure that what we suffering for what? As Christian, meaning as, as service to the most high through Christ. Right? Somebody's getting locked up. Because he was driving drunk, he was a murderer, he was, you know, went to some club, got into a fight, he's dancing with some man's woman, fornicating, that spirit, that reverent spirit is in there, right? And then now he gets locked up. And he's reading the scripture here. Oh, man, 
there's no temptation taking you. No, you you suffering as an evildoer. Now, is there is there room for repentance? That's up to the Most High through Christ. Is there room for mercy? That's of the Lord. But we have to make a difference with the temptations that the Most High is going to try us, right? Like scriptures tell us that this is gold is tried in the fire, so it's acceptable men in the furnace of affliction. We got to look at, okay, the temptations, the trials that Christ went through, Abraham went through, right? Moses went through, all the prophets, all the believers went through. Some losing their life as they're going through the temptations, right? But there was what? They were suffering for it for righteousness sake. As opposed to those that died, but they was what? They was taking pleasures and sins. That's different. You receiving the judgment because you you doing wicked works, right? And the in the wages of sin is what? Death. So there's a difference in, in in saying, you know, brother, I'm going through different temptations. I'm you know, I'm going through some hard times. All right, but make sure that what? We examine in ourselves. Right? Most high is trying to get our attention. Let it be for, for you know, to, to work righteousness within us. As opposed to, hey, most high's casting us because we we define, like we we breaking the commandments and that that judgment is just because we being judged as evildoers. So that's there's the difference. So let's go back to to James the first chapter. More than likely, we'll probably have to finish this lesson as far as the topic going back to Romans 12. We might not be able to get back to it due, due to time, but be the most high as well, whether tomorrow, uh, when we keep the new moon Sabbath or next Sabbath, we'll try to continue on. But kind of see what the Spirit is taking the scriptures to. James 1. Before James, what scripture was we holding? Before we go back to Romans 12. John 3, right? Yeah, we didn't finish John 3. So we might end the lesson today at John 3, and then Lord willing, we'll revisit Romans the 12th chapter, the next lesson. So James 3, well, James, James 1, sorry, James 1. Let's read it from 12 again. So we'll read it, James 1 to 12, down to about 16, and then we'll more than likely end the class, the lesson today, at, back at John 3. So J James 1 and 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. See, so this is a whole summary of the lives of all the believers, right? Of the elect, right? This is this is the end of our faith. This is not talking about just you know because it's it, it, what did it mention that that tells us that it's at the end when Christ comes back as far as the, the judgment. It says he shall receive the crown of life, right? Has anyone received the crown of life yet for for resisting Satan presently? No. Now we do receive a blessing, right? Most God builds our faith. He builds our patience. He builds our understanding. He builds our experience where we trust in him and we see the fruits of, of the, the resisting the temptations to sin. But that's a daily effort, right? Because we could start out, right? We could start out believing. We could start out enduring. We could start out, you know, not, not, Putting father, mother, son, daughter before the most high through Christ. And then you're doing that for a week. You're doing that for a month. What about next year? And now you get weak. You know, most high, okay, you, you amps up the temptation. Oh, I didn't think that one, that, that, that's a tough one. Well, we just read First Corinthians, First Corinthians 10, right? Most high being faithful, he will not allow you, he will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, right? So, we have to understand each day, each week, each month, each year, we're supposed to be going what? Getting stronger in the faith. Not not backsliding. And I feel like my spirit is diminishing. I feel like my faith in the most high, well, what's, what's going on? Examine yourself. What is it that you're entertaining to make you feel that, you know, now you, you're getting weaker in the faith? We should be coming stronger. To the point where 
younger brothers and sisters coming in, now we're being that, that, that example unto them because we've experienced a lot of the things that they're presently experiencing. Yeah, my, my father, my mother, my, my friends, my relatives, they don't want to have anything to do with me. And, and I don't know, this is making me feel bad. Like I'm doing something. I'm, I'm trying to follow the scriptures, but, you know, when I'm amongst them, they still want me the same old, be the same old person that they knew. And I don't know how to deal with that because I, I got to tell them, no, I don't do these things no more. I don't, I don't break the most high commandments like, like that, but I love them. You know, I still want to be with them, and then that's my family. This, well, scriptures already told us. Let's go into the scriptures. See, now we could confidently go into the scriptures and say in a way where we ourselves experienced it. Yeah, there was a time, brother, like I, I was like contemplating, like I was doing something wrong. Like I, I was feeling sad. I was feeling like, you know, like I'm doing, you know, like I'm betraying my family. Well, Christ said, a man, if you... You got to hate your own father, mother, your son, your daughter to be his disciple. You got in the scripture. So you got to hate your own life. You're like, man, you just think it's just about family, friends. It's going to come down to even you, what you want to do. You know, the things that you trying to pursue it like, wait, nah, it's a, for me to be that type of person, which means I'm going to have to put the scriptures aside. Right. I'm going to have to conform to the world. But you wasn't saying that on day one when you first came in. Like we was reading it, the classes go out, you listen to the lesson, but it's not until you start to experience it. And then you start to, and then most times it's molding us. There's times we, we apply it, there's times we fail, and then we come back in scripture. Most times, Christ, give me that spirit to, to endure it, right? Then one year, five years, ten years, we're supposed to what? Growing stronger, right? Being, be, becoming more. Like it tells us in First Corinthians 15, unmovable, right? When you're unmovable, you, you've seen a lot of things. You've, and then it's the most high preparing. You know how when you go to school, first grade, second grade, now, now you're graduating, now you're going to the next level. Well, now every day we have to remember, okay, the, the temptation is going to get stronger and stronger. But what's supposed to be stronger within us to, to help us overcome it? Most high is going to make a way, which is the way Christ is the way, the truth and the life, right? So let me, I'm a believe upon Christ. Whatever I'm going through now, Christ went through it. So let me go to the source to be able to overcome it. Let me get into the scriptures. Right? And at times you can't think of the scriptures. Well, that's why most of puts brothers and sisters, you know, especially brothers and sisters with experience, right? The scripture speaks about how you have a thousand friends, but amongst a thousand friends, one counselor. So you have to now, who should I counsel with? When it comes to certain matters, weighty matters, heavy situations you're going through, right? We might be all brethren. We all, you know, brothers and sisters in the faith. But then there's certain things. Okay, most of them, let me deal with the elders in the situation, right? There might be things amongst the brethren. Okay, brother, have that experience, brother. Let me give you those. Here are three, four scriptures here. Man, I needed to hear them scriptures, all praises. But then they might, you know, similar to when you read in, um, and, and when Moses was, um, his, his father-in-law was uh, letting them know, and that was the Most High, revealing that, to set up, like, the soldiers and officers to help Moses in, 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 in guiding Israel, right? And it was to help Israel, I mean, it was to help Moses to make the work lighter for Moses. And then Moses would tell them, okay, the things that, that the, the smaller matters, you know, and these are men that, Men that was full of faith, men that hated, hated covetousness, men that was full of the Holy Spirit that was chosen to have those offices, right? Now, under the Old Covenant, there's a difference. Under the Old Covenant, most I was saying, among these men, choose captains, make them officers of tens, of hundreds, thousands, right? But these are men that was guiding Israel right along with Moses and dealing with, with, with matters amongst Israel, right? People have things, you know, are differences, okay, they don't know how to deal with it, well, you go to the judges. And then the way, the, the weighty, the heavy matters, Moses told them, then you bring it unto me, because there's certain things, well, that's above the spirit that the Most High gave me to deal with the situation, let's bring it to Moses. But now we're dealing with captains and officers in, 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 the, in, in, in Christ now being a high priest. Now we're under the priesthood of Christ and not of the, the, the Levitical priesthood, 
Are we are we dealing with captains and officers as far as ranks amongst the church? No, right? Because you have groups, you know, Israelite groups that that because they're not putting Christ first, they're not making the doctrine about Christ, and they may, they making the doctrines about following men, right? Traditions of men, leaven of men. Now they can't make the distinction between the old covenant having waxing away and then being replaced by the new covenant by Christ down on the cross for our sins. We say through Christ, right? And so now through Christ, you read in Ephesians 4, Romans 12, and other scriptures like um, 1 Corinthians 12, in which through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, most high through Christ is going to give, beginning with the men, as far as the spirit to be what? Teachers, right? Um, disciples. Uh, ministers, pastors, workers of miracles, right? And so you're not reading, brother, you're captain of 10. Take this test here, and then you, 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 you productive in that for six months, and then we'll raise you up to an officer. Where do you read that in? Even, even under the old covenant, it was not set up that way, right? Where do you read about Moses when he was setting up captains and officers amongst the tribes? It was based off a 20-question test. And you already have the answer to study that. This is school. That kind of fool. We've taken worldliness and then we're trying to incorporate that with the scriptures. But where do men get that spirit? When they're being led of the devil and not of the Holy Spirit through Christ. Right? So I, I, I'm saying all this just to, to kind of bring about the point as far as when we're dealing with, with, with matters, with temptations, heaviness of heart, even in the council, right? Even amongst the church. The scriptures let you know, like, who do you counsel with, right? And I think a, a good good chapter that goes into it, uh, Ecclesiastes 37, where it tells you, like, when you counsel, make sure that the person you're counseling with doesn't have some type of ulterior motive, right? Because some, some people counsel for themselves. Their life is miserable. They're going through certain things, and they want your life to be miserable. They're going to give you the bad counsel. And then the scriptures tell you they're going to stand to the side to see how your life is going to turn out. And that goes back to the topic, let love be without dissimulation, right? Because it should always be the way we're going to deal and interact with brothers and sisters is going to be based on the same love that Christ expressed to the disciples and the believers. Christ never did anything to try to promote himself or did something towards the disciples or the believers that was going to be hurtful unto them, detrimental towards them, right? So Christ always stayed in the commandments of the Most High in guiding Israel. And that's the same footsteps we will follow as being believers of Christ. So let's continue. Let's read verse 13. Did um No, let's read 12 again. James 1 and 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, right, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. So that's a constant trial. And who's, who's behind the trials? We read it in, in 1 Corinthians 10. Right? The Most High is behind it. Most High is faithful. So Most High is right there. He's, he's sitting back with Christ and then seeing how you're going to deal with the situation. Are you going to deal with it carnally? Are you going to deal with it spiritual? Right? Are you going to submit yourself to doing the will of God? Being in the scriptures, meditating on the scriptures, reflecting on the scriptures? And then what? When time comes, apply the scriptures. Satan's job is to cause you to fail, right? Satan's job is to get you, make you get weak, you know, make you doubt the scriptures, make you doubt the Most High, make you doubt Christ, make you doubt yourself. I can't do this. I'm weak. You know, I'll never get it right. This is the third time, the fourth time, the tenth time. Well, it just goes to show you that what? We're not putting on the spirit of the Most High through Christ. We're not trusting the Most High through Christ. We're not resisting the devil. Maybe that's why you fail the two times, the three times. You fail in patience. You didn't, you didn't abide patiently in the scriptures and apply them and resist the devil. Right, and then the, the the verse says, "When we've tried, he shall receive." Not maybe, right? It, it, it is is uh, Moses' expectation, Abraham's expectation, that they're gonna receive the crown, or maybe we're gonna receive. When 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 the choice Most High called Moses out of Egypt, right, because he was raised as the son of Pharaoh's daughter, right? Like Moses, we know he's an Israelite; he's a, of the tribe of Levi, right? And so Most High put Moses in that situation for a time that he was going to call him to lead Israel out of Egypt, right? But 
by the time Mosai is calling Moses to come be a leader and deliver for Israel, Moses is already in a good situation. He's being raised in Pharaoh's house <laughs> like, as a prince, right? While the rest of Israel is in that captivity, that captivity that Mo Mosai, you know, revealed unto Abraham, right? That Israel was going to be a serve a nation, right? For the extent of 400 years with rigor, hard bondage, right? So now Mosai calling Moses, wait a minute. I'm raising you up to deliver your own people out of the hand of, of, of Pharaoh and the Egyptians. Moses could have looked, man, wait a minute. I'm not out there. I'm not building cities and roads and and, and, and picking up crops for the Egyptians. I'm living a good life. I'm in I'm in the palace. I'm treated here like, you know, like a, a prince. I'm I'm next in line to be the next Pharaoh, right? Moses could have done that. Right? But what does uh, Hebrews 11 tell us to summarize Moses' decision as far as why he, he, he rejected being called the, the, the son of Pharaoh's daughter? What was, in, what was in Moses' mind? Because mind you, Moses was raised in the commandments of the Most High by his mother, right? Because his mother was, was chosen to, to, to be a, 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 a nursemaid. Right, in, in raising Moses from young. So you know his mother's teaching him the commandments. By the time he's of age, Moses calling him. But don't you think that was a, a temptation for Moses? <laughs> well, yeah, I'm just going to drop everything, you know. Get, I don't care about Egypt. Egypt is going down the drain. I'm leaving. Oh, Moses is looking at, at the fine, finer things of life, the riches, the glory of Egypt, you know, his position, his status. And then he has to walk away from it. And then trust in the Most High that Most High is going to take down this kingdom. And then deliver his people. So, but why did, why did Moses make that, that, that choice? What was, what was driving that decision by Moses? Right? To, in the same decisions that drive us every day in the temptations that we go through. Faith, Faith right? He trusted. He's like, I'm not trusting in the riches of Egypt. That's for a season. That's for a short time. And then how quickly was Egypt going to be taken down? <laughs> Not soon after the Most High called him out of that, that life. <laughs> and then Egypt never regained that, that, that power, that stronghold, as a, as, a, as a mighty nation upon the earth since then, as a superpower, right? But had, had Moses had not that faith, he could have been like, nah, you pick somebody else. I'm good here, right? Now, would he have received that crown of life when Christ comes back, the second coming of Christ? No. So he he did the will of God to the point where he died in the wilderness. He didn't get it to enter into the land of Canaan. But he knew that what? The greater kingdom, right? That was going to be what? Long after. Whenever Christ comes back, right? In the resurrection. And he believed in that. He died in faith. It says, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. So including Moses as an example that we mentioned. So now verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. See? Now you read this scripture here that we just read and then reflect on 1 Corinthians the test chapter. It says the Most High is faithful. See, Most High would not be faithful if he put a temptation in our path, a trial in our path, but with the intention of what? That you that you fail. God's intention. He's, he's tricking you here. He, he, he's putting up obstacles that's so hard. He, he most high is already laughing. There's no way Kabar is gonna do this. <laughs> I'm gonna. And most high is rejoicing, watching you, like fall into that sin. No, he says, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. So when it says when you tempted here, meaning you gave place to the devil. Whatever that temptation was, you got out the spirit. And then now you're trying to justify it. Well, God put me in that situation. I did that because that was the will of God. No. What should come to mind is I'm resisting the temptation because I know what the Most High is doing here. Most High is proving me. Most High is trying me. See? That's what the scripture tells us that, um, in, in 1 Samuel. Uh, is it 15? Where it speaks about how we're not to talk no more exceedingly proudly. Right? Let's read that one real quick. First Samuel 
want to say 15. Uh, is that the one where it speaks about um, the Most High is a God of knowledge and by Him actions awake? Y'all know the scripture? I might be in here right now. I'm not seeing it. Can one of y'all grab that for me real quick? Uh, the one is first two and three. Two and three, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm thinking of 15 because 15 is the one that goes into how rebellion when Moses uh, sent Samuel to deal with, with Saul. And then Saul was already given place to the devil. All right. Thank you, brothers. First Samuel 2. All right. First Samuel, the, the second chapter, verse 3. That one verse. So this is one of the verses that we summarize it. It's, it's talk is cheap when it comes to serving the Most High, right? So let's read First Samuel two and three. And in Christ, Isaiah was saying the same thing, right? With their hearts and with their mouths, Israel loved to serve the Most High in that fashion, right? But their their hearts going after their what their wickedness. So 1 Samuel 2 and 3. Talk no more so exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth. See, then you see those colons there. Okay, this is what we should be doing, right? Just talking. Brother, I, I, I read about five chapters every night in the scriptures. You know, uh, it, it, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly meditating on the scriptures. I'm, I'm constantly studying the scriptures and you so you don't talking. You quoting scriptures, a, a topic you you know fifty precepts. Brother, you know some scriptures on prayer. Uh, brother, man, 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 like, like, like a a, a a concordance, right? You know all these precepts, right? But then what what might that person lack? It says, for the Lord, the latter part of verse three in First Samuel two, for the Lord is a God of knowledge. See, so the the Most High knows the the the, the heart. He knows the intents of a man, right? You could be talking to a brother, quoting scriptures, and most, but most high knows what's in your heart, right? And what's in a man's heart? Wickedness, right? If it's void of the, the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, right? So scripture says, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him, actions are weighed. See? Every, every, most high is, is determined whether this brother or this sister is true. By what? Based on lip service? Based on quoting scriptures? Based on you could expound on different topics? You could have a, a two, three hour class? No. Most times looking back at what? He's really, he's, he's judging every man and woman based on what? Your actions. Right? And so when we're going through the temptations, we're going through trials, you might be a brother that you give him brother good counsel, good advice, but then most eyes, okay, now it's your turn. Your turn to go to these temptations. Okay, we reflect back. Now I was giving that brother like 50 scriptures. Now I'm going to it. What should I be doing? Well, reflect back on these same scriptures that you were trying to edify a brother or sister not long ago. Now it's time for you to apply. Now it's, it's time for you to what? Walk the walk, right? The, Reflecting on this, didn't was Christ about lip service? When Christ told Satan, "Get thee hence from me," when when Christ was quoted in Deuteronomy the eighth chapter, and, and, and telling Satan, "Man shall not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Most High, doth man live." Did Christ just say it, and then turn around and make bread out of the, the stones? He quoted, he knows the scripture. Yeah, but now I'm hungry though. I know the scripture, but I've been fasting for forty days. Like, I don't think I'm going to make it one more day if I don't eat. So he's done it for 40 days. He's been trusting the Most High all that time. And then the 40th day comes, and now Most High turns the heat up. And then Satan, get him. Satan's coming hard. See, and Mo what happened when Satan, when Christ resisted the devil? Scriptures tell you, Satan went away for a season, and, and what was that replaced with? Most High sent angels to minister unto Christ. See, whatever Christ needed, 
at that point. It then expound as far as, you know, what, how the Most High sustain them. But one, one thing we know is Most High, by, by Christ resisting the devil, he trusted and believed in the Most High, and he showed it by what? As we read here. Actions. Right? Most High could have said, oh, yeah, I know Christ is going to do my will. He's been teaching. He's, he's been bringing forth the gospel and teaching the word of God unto Israel. Now he, Christ is in the same temptations. Now he's folding. He won't know what to do. He's getting weak. Oh, he, he proved his love for the Most High by what? By his actions. By resisting the devil. And then when he did that, as we read in 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, right? Most High knew what Christ was able to, to bear. Most High told Satan, this is your boundary. This is the extent of it. This is how far you're going to go. And then now if Christ trusting and believing God and resisting, once he's done that, and the Most High deems it's time for Satan to back off, I right, Satan, back off. Now angels, righteous spirits is now with Christ, dealing with Christ, sustaining Christ, giving Christ whatever he needs as a blessing because he endured the temptation. And that's the same things that we go through. Christ is with us every step of the way. Right? That's, that's why it goes into Most High is going to make a way that what we may be what to be able to bear it. Right? So let's go back to James 1. So we're going to end it there, and then Lord willing, we'll take it from John 3, the next lesson. So uh, James, the first chapter. Let's go back. James 1, verse 13 again. Let no man say when he is tempted, so this is going into, we're not just simply being in the temptations. Now you, you've, you've stepped out of the scriptures. <laughs> the scriptures we know. We should know better, right? But because... You know, like, like Christ tells us that what we, we have to be what? Constantly watching and praying, right? Because the flesh, the spirit is willing, but what? The flesh is weak. So we have to know without the Most High, without Christ, in our minds, for one minute, for one moment, what's going to replace it? Satan's looking for opportunity to get in. And then we give him that, we find ourselves what? Now we, we, we break the Most High's commandments. And then worse, now we say, I am tempted of God. You're justifying why you sin, and then you blame it on the Most High. Because he put you in that situation. He, 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 he put you in those circumstances that he wanted you to fail. No, no, you wanted to fail. You made Satan your God, right? You became a servant of sin instead of a servant of, of righteousness. And the latter part of 13 says, for God cannot see, be tempted with evil. Neither tempteth he any man. See, God is not a, a power that takes pleasure in sin. He says, thou shalt not commit adultery, he's doing it. Thou shalt do no murder, he's doing it. See, God is, he's not a power that's about evil, that's about wickedness. And then for, for, for him to not, to persuade, to compel others to do the same thing. So when you read it in, in, um, in the scriptures where it mentions that Christ didn't think it robbery right? in Ephesians, the second chapter, right? It mentioned that he didn't think it robbery to be equal with the Most High. Was, was Christ thinking that I'm going to be wicked like the Most High? No. Christ's mind is always I'm pleasing to God. I'm trusting God. And I'm not going to depart. I'm not going to step out of God's commandments for any reason. Because him only, the Most High only, is who Christ is going to serve. Right? And so that, that's, how we, that's how we look at the temptations. So at times, if we do give place to sin... Well, who's behind it? <laughs> Whose fault was it? Let's read on. Right? But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. So is it the most high that's putting your lust, that lust in your heart? No, that's your lust. That's your desire. Right? To break the most high's commandments. When Israel wanted to go back to Egypt, whose who's desire was, was it the most high? No. Most high was telling Pharaoh, let my people go that they may serve me. So how now most I going to put a spirit in your heart to want to go back to that same wicked lifestyle? No. That's your desire. Right? And it says, every man is tempted, meaning every man 
is given over to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, sins when he is drawn away of his own lust and attached. See? So who's who's the person to blame? We, certainly we know it's not the most high. It's not even in the case of, let's say, Joseph had committed fornication or adultery with Potiphar's wife. He couldn't even come back and say that, that was Potiphar's wife. I was minding my business. I was here tending to Potiphar's, you know, my responsibilities. And this wicked woman comes. I would have never done it. That My mind wasn't about that. And then she made me do it. Could, could, could Joseph have justified himself in the sight of Mosai with that reasoning? If she never came into the room, I would have never done it. So therefore, God, you put her in that situation. Didn't Adam say that <laughs> when he ended up sinning? He gave place to the to the devil as as Eve did. The woman you gave. The, the, oh, so most I say it was not good that man should dwell, dwell alone, but that he have that help me, right? So he's not thinking about all the good things, the blessings that came. Now, was he saying that in a negative way when he's loving his wife and and. and and the joy that he got with his wife? Was he saying something negative to the Most High then? No, it's now he sinned. And then now, let me put the blame, let me not take the blame for myself. Let me blame it on my wife. Now, now was 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 Eve innocent of her sins? No, Most High brought forth judgment upon the woman. But who had the, the greater responsibility? Adam, because Adam was made the head of, of his wife, just as the Most High has made the head of all the Israelite women is who their husbands, and who's the head of the man, the Israelite man. Christ is our head, and who's Christ's head according to First Corinthians the eleventh chapter? The Most High. See, there's order. Christ didn't step out of order, but yet the man did, and then the woman did. Right, but when they did, whose fault was it? Adam couldn't say it was. Eve, Eve couldn't say it was the devil. Oh, but the devil, the devil beguiled me. And then, no, you knew better. Didn't Adam teach you the commandments that I, most high through Christ taught Adam? Well, what was the breakdown? Every man is tempted, in verse 14, when he is tempted. I mean, every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. See, that was where your heart was at. That's your desire was towards that. And so you gave place. To, that's something you wanted to do. Whereas we know better. Most of us say, don't do this. Keep my commandments and live. Right? Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. All commandments. So forth and so forth. Whenever we step out of any of them, the brother provoked me. The brother got on my nerves. The brother said this, that. So I, I retaliated. Okay, your job was supposed to what? Correct your neighbor, restore your brother in the right spirit, right? And then forgive your brother the fault that he has done, the hurt that he has done towards you. That's what you should have done in that situation, right? Not give give place now, you're getting proud, making it personal. You gotta look, wait a minute, Christ was offended, just as I'm offended. And then Christ, he, he was persecuted being a righteous man, right? Being perfect, having never sinned. And here we are, we, we wicked, Right? We sinful just as the next man is, right? And yet now we retaliate and we think in evil, we dealing in malice, and then we're trying to justify it. Can we do that? No. Every man is tempted, as we read here, when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust, verse 15, James 1, 15, then when lust hath conceived. So where's the lust conceiving? As Christ said, out of the heart proceed evil, evil what? Thoughts, right? Where's the heart is, is the, the organ, what, what, what's the heart going into? Your mind, right? So the things that's in your mind, the things that you meditate, and the things that you, you constantly minded of, right? It's eventually going to come out of what? In the, in the actions, in your works, right? Then when lust have conceived, meaning now it's one thing, the thought comes in and then you, you rebuke the devil, like right away. Like I shouldn't be thinking about that. My mind was I was gonna like go off on his brother for what he just said or did. You know what? Let me understand. Let me pray, and then I know what he did or said was wrong. But then let me deal with it spiritually, right? Let me take my spirit out of it, and then we come with Christ's spirit, Christ's mind. 
to restore the brother. Right? When you do that, there's a better chance that what? The brother or sister may see themselves. And then on top of that, what? You didn't give place to the devil. Because Satan, Satan wants you to sin just as a brother or sister just sinned against you. Right? Satan wants two or three people to go off. Right? Satan doesn't want re peace being restored amongst the church. The righteousness of the Most High being restored. Charity, patience, long-suffering, praying for one another. Satan doesn't want that. Satan wants division in the church. Right? So we read in here, it says, then what lust have conceived in, in the mind, it bring up forth what sin. See, so, where do we, where, so where should we be shutting down the sin? In the mind, don't let it conceive. Don't let, don't let it kind of like fester to the one month, one year, two years. Are you still in the church? You still amongst the brothers, the, the church, the sisters, but it's only a matter of time, right? And then, just like Saul, right? We didn't get to read it, but that's when I was making reference to First uh, Samuel, the fifteenth chapter. That rebellion that Saul had within him, when the Most High rose him to be the first king over Israel, it wasn't something that just came came out overnight. As, as far as him breaking the Most High's commandment, it was a constant rebellion. A constant, I'm going to do what I want to do. And then Most High knew, okay, this is the last time. So we don't want to now tempt the Most High in that fashion to where we know better, but we add in sin upon sin. There comes a point where now Most High say, well, you know what? I'm taking that Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit that comes from the Most High in Christ to build us up to where to where we able to resist the devil. If we don't use that to our own advantage, but we want to go back in the flesh, can we can can we serve two masters? The Holy Spirit of the Most High abiding within us, and then now we meditate upon wickedness. We live in separate lives. We wavering. No. Eventually, Most High is going to say, "Well, you know what? You want to be in the world. You need a hot. You need a cold. You want to be lukewarm. You want to be in the middle. You want to." Ride the fence on both sides? Well, no man could serve two masters. And that's what the Most High did to Saul, and, and, and to the point where Saul was entertaining all types of foolishness, wickedness, witchcraft. The things that he was stamping out of Israel, now he was what? Bringing that back in, beginning with himself. And to the point Most High, what? Killed him, put him to death. Yeah. So we reading that what? When the lust is conceived, there's no two ways about it. It's gonna be, it's gonna bring forth what? Is it gonna bring righteousness? You you meditate upon wicked things. It's only a matter of time before it plays out in our actions. And when it is finished, see, so I'm done. I sinned. I broke the Most High's commandments. I defiled the Sabbath day. I committed fornication, right? I committed idolatry. I committed hatred, murder towards my brother. It's done. I did it, right? What happens next? You go on and, and you, move, you, you move forward with your life. Blessings come out of it. No, the latter end of, of, of sin, the judgment says what? When it is finished, bring up forth death. See that? There's no two ways about it. It's, it's, it's not going to bring forth a blessing. The blessing should be what? The crown of life that the Most High promised unto those that love him. So if we love the Most High, we know the love of the Most High is to what? To keep his commandments. And Christ said the same thing, John 14, 15. If you love me, what? Keep my commandments. So if if we break in the Most High in Christ's commandments, what are we showing? That we have hatred for the Most High in Christ. And in that hatred, we're not going to prosper in that. If it goes unrepented, what's the eventual outcome? We're going to lose out what? On that crown of life, eternal life, immortality at the second coming of Christ. So verse 16 says what? Do not err my beloved brethren. So now don't give place to the devil. Don't sin. Or is going into what? Don't sleep on these scriptures to where now we, we not looking in a way where, you know what, let me not behave or, 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 or think or, or, or deal in a way that what, that's going to cause me to be an enemy of the most high in Christ. Let me stay in these scriptures because there's no fruit in willfully transgress these commandments and not repent, not put it off, not cast it off. Right? Because at the end of the day, even those that die in their sins, that's not the final death. That still remains a judgment day. Right? And that's the judgment day that what? The scripture speaks concerning those that, that died and not believe and not having faith. Scripture tells us it's going to be 
weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's going to be anguish and pain and sorrows uh, and reflection of when they had an opportunity to delve right in the scriptures, they cast Christ aside, not thinking that there was going to be a day in which all the things that they did would be brought forth to light and they would have to give answer for it. Right? And on top of that, they seen Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they seen all the righteous that suffered patiently, that went through the temptations, that believed even unto death, and then they see them going in. And then they, now they're going in flames right along with the rest of the wicked. See? So we have to trust and believe that if we do the will of God and we continue in it patiently, right, the dead in Christ shall, shall be raised first, right along with those that are alive at, at Christ's coming, and then receiving the blessing, right? Receiving the end of our faith, eternal life. So we'll end there, Lord willing, and, um, We'll try to go back to John, the third chapter, and, and finish off in Romans, the 12th chapter, the next lesson. So, all praise to the Heavenly Father in the name of Christ, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, for, the, for these scriptures. And Lord, well, hopefully everyone is edified. So, we'll end with a prayer, and then we'll do uh, the Lord's communion. for the whole church, brothers and sisters, is going through different ailments, trials, tribulations, afflictions, infirmities, and, and, and persecutions, that the Most High may have mercy upon us as we examine ourselves and, and praying for mercy, that the Most High may deliver us out of them all. So this is uh, Psalms, the third chapter, Let's meditate and pray. Lord, why are they increased that trouble me? Many, many are they that rise up against me. Many that be would say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of my head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. I laid me down and slept. I wait for the Lord sustain me. I will not be afraid of ten thousand of people that have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all my enemies upon the cheekbone. That has broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation, salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. Our praises to Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we ask and pray that your Holy Spirit be upon the whole church, and that you may have mercy upon us and forgive us for all our transgressions, and cleanse our hearts and our hands from wickedness, and that you may bless us with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to be able to resist temptations faithfully through the Holy Spirit Christ, and that we may continue in the faith patiently and not turn back and not conform to the ways of this world, but that we may, through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, apply the scriptures, walk in them and live in them and be an example in our homes and amongst the church and amongst all Israel, and that we may be an example in the scriptures and abound in the faith and endure hardness as a good soldier even unto the end. In Christ's name we pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Amen. Amen. All right, Israel, peace and blessings. Most high Christ bless you all. Happy Sabbath. Lord willing, we'll get ready to do the Lord's communion. And uh, brothers and sisters that wish to partake in the communion with us, you're more than welcome to. Just give us a moment to get the bread and wine ready. Most high Christ bless everyone. Happy Sabbath. So tomorrow at even is um, the new moon Sabbath. And so Lord willing, we'll be coming together as far as the church here in Jacksonville at 6 p.m. for the service. New moon Sabbath, Sunday sundown to Monday sundown. Lord willing.
So we'll read Matthew 26, 26, where the Lord established this ordinance or as the, the communion. Matthew 26, 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink, eat all of it. But this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So we're commanded by Christ to observe this ordinance, which involves eating a piece of unleavened bread, as we read here, which is symbolic of Christ's body that was broken on the cross for Israel's sins, and then also taking a sip of wine, a small sip of wine. And as we drink it, we're acknowledging that this is symbolic of Christ's blood that was spilling across to bring forth the New Testament. So our salvation, our, our, our observance of the Most High Commandments, in which will lead to eternal life, is through faith in Christ. That's how that mercy was established upon Israel and bringing peace between the Heavenly Father and Christ. And so the Scriptures let us know that we're supposed to do this ordinance daily. And as we eat of the bread and drink of the wine, which is symbolically representing Christ's body and his blood, we to do so worthily, right? Worthily, as we read in the scriptures today, constantly examine ourselves from dead works, right? And it's not about, as we read in scriptures, it's not about words or, or, or lip service, right? We read in 1 Samuel 2, God is the power of knowledge, and by him, actions await. And so we're constantly being examined by the Most High through Christ, to show whether we're going to love him or no in keeping his, his, his commandments. And that involves daily resisting temptations to sin, right? And so as we're doing it, we know we're doing it through, through the Holy Spirit and not of ourselves. That's, that's the hope, that's the confidence that we have that the Most High through Christ is always going to be there with us. Now, it comes down to what are we going to do, right? Every man has a choice, right? And the, the, the right choices we make is going to determine whether we're going to live to to live again or are we going to live and then at the day of judgment we're going to face that fire right so we're going to have to we're constantly making those decisions every day of our life and for those that love the most high through christ and resisting those temptations the blessing is what everlasting life and so that's the path lord willing through the holy spirit that that's the blessing we desire we desiring for so as we know in the scriptures, we could do all things through Christ, which is giving us that strength, right? That that spirit. So let's be, do a prayer. Most of us bless the bread and the wine. Meditate and pray. The Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we ask and pray that you bless our bread and our wine, which represents the body and the blood of our Lord. This we do in remembrance of remembrance of you until your second coming. Thank you. I'm not. everyone peace and blessings most high christ bless you all have a blessed sabbath most high christ bless you sister diana salutes everyone happy sabbath
Marquez, his household, keeping you all in prayer. All God's mercy and healing. Sister Sharon, all time Christ bless you in your house as well. Happy Sabbath. And everyone else that's on this call, you might not see, uh, not the call, but the, the live feed here. I'm not able to see everyone, but salutations to everyone. All time bless you and your families. Bless, bless you with good and righteous spirits to constantly examine ourselves and making good decisions to receive the blessings from the Most High. All right. We'll uh, sign off there. Lord willing, we'll come back together again tomorrow uh, when we observe uh, the New Moon Sabbath, uh, 6 p.m. here in, uh, as far as the service for the Church of Jacksonville. So, Lord willing, have a for the rest of the Sabbath. Have a blessed day, and time bless you all in your homes. Right. Shalom.